Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. CJ is still in Tempe. He was at the final Arizona Coyotes game yesterday. We'll get to that. But first, let's do a Leafs corner. Uh, They just played their final game of the regular season. Austin Matthews does not get to goal number 70. And now, for the Leafs, a series against the Boston Bruins awaits. This is as close as we can get to for for a uh, playoff preview between those two teams. I know some people are dreading the possibility of uh, playing against the Boston Bruins from the Leafs fan uh, vantage point anyway. But let's talk about Austin Matthews and the fact that he did not get to 70. How much of the game were you able to watch yesterday? And what do you think of the fact that he just misses out on a high plateau? Well, I uh, watched basically the first half um, before I had to head over to Mullet Arena. And, you know, it wasn't lost on me, kind of the weird juxtaposition. Here you are, you know, I'm sitting 30 minutes from where Austin Matthews was raised, a place where hockey hasn't been traditional on the night that we're bidding goodbye to the Coyotes from an NHL perspective. And here's a kid from Scottsdale chasing down something that hasn't happened in, you know, 30 plus years. And, and, you know, even though he ends up one goal short, it certainly wasn't for lack of trying. I'm sure you saw the shot off the crossbar, the 10 or 11 shots on goal that, that Matt Tonkin's kind of an unlikely starter for Tampa, um, you know, turned away in that game. And, you know, I, I don't think it's in any way diminishes the season. I mean, obviously when you're that close, like William Nylander who ends at 99 points. I mean, you, you like the big round number. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, a 69-goal season, you haven't seen that uh, since Mario Lemieux. And so, you know, when, you, when you're when you putting yourself in that company, I think, um, and you step back and look at it, I mean, what what a year tip you had. And, you know, most important, I guess, is that he did get his shots at it. You know, I know we talked about it in recent weeks. What are they going to do? How are they going to manage that? I think it was only right that they gave him the chance to play those last two games to – to you know, have that that shot. His parents, Brian and Emma, were in the crowd. Uh, were there just in case he could do it, and you know he came through it healthy for, by all accounts. And and you know, the Leafs got a couple of days now until they go back into the belly of the beast at TD Garden. Oh my God! Uh, the way you the way you put it, the belly of the beast. <laughs> I'm, I'm, don't forgive me for laughing, but like you're right. Like again, Leafs. Bruins, we've seen this in 2013, 2018, 2019. Again, but also this has to happen. This has to this has to be it. I, I just just give me a second here. I know that Leafs fan. Just give me a second. Leafs fans, I get it. You hate this. This is how this has to go. Everyone in our lives at some point was afraid of the dark. Afraid of the boogeyman. Something scary hiding underneath your bed. And at some point in your life, you had to step up and face your fear and get over it. Slaying the dragon and all that. This will be so satisfying if this team finds a way to do it against the Boston Bruins. And and look, the Bruins, they have a lot to prove in this too. They lost last year in the first round. They have the best regular season of anyone. And they lost in the first round. They are not going to go down fighting. They're not going to go down crying. But, like, if the Leafs find a way to do it this year, like, it's going to be the most satisfying thing this franchise has had in a long time. Like, maybe it's because I'm an outsider, but, like, if I'm a Leafs fan, this is how I'm approaching the series. I just had to get that off. That's fair. And, you know, it's funny because there's it's kind of a tale of two series, right? I mean, for the participants in it, I, I don't think the, the spectacle of the Bruins means nearly as much. You know what I mean? There, there's only five players on the Leafs roster that were – even part of those series is, you know, in 2018 and 2019, let alone 2013, you know, which is one that, that still sticks in the memories of Leafs fans. So I think that this is, and I'm, I'm certainly not this like dispelling the fan thing because it's, it's real. Like I get it. There's some scars there. Um, if you're of a certain age and you've watched this team have to, to play games in Boston, a lot of them have gone the wrong way. They've lost game sevens there um, in, and in one-sided fashion in a couple of cases or, dramatic fashion in the 2013 case where they blew that lead in the third period. So, you know, it hangs over the way I think people will experience it on the inside. I really don't think that part matters quite as much. And, you know, the Leafs are also built a little differently and, and, you know, it's been kind of a point of 
discussion for sure, maybe debate in some corners about, you know, having someone like Ryan Reeves on the roster, you know, bringing in Max Domi, Tyler Bertuzzi, players that, you know, I think Brad True Living, when you go back to last summer, we're, we're hoping would, would maybe just give a little different element um, to this team when the games got harder, when, when the space out there disappeared, when, when you had to push through, which is, which is what you're here for now. And, and I think, you know, this, this Leafs team is, you know, for good or ill, I'm not, I'm not saying this as a prediction. I really don't know what's going to happen in the series. I don't have a good feel, you know, I don't have like, I'm not being compelled one way or the other, but you know, they're different. They're, I think they are going to stand up physically in, in the series and, you know, it's it, to me from the Toronto end of it. It's it's a question: How does the defense hold up? Um, you know, they've got nine players back there, but what does the top six look like? And is it going to be stout enough? And then obviously goaltending, I think, will be a big storyline. You know, Ilya Samsonov didn't play either of the last two games uh, for the Leafs here in the regular season this week. I mean, meaningless games by and large, other than some of those milestone achievements. But you know, the two games he started prior to that didn't go so well, and so you know which. Which version of the Leafs goaltending will show up? I think we'll we'll probably have a big say in you know how this ends up going in the best of seven. Also, when you look at Austin Matthews in this series, the expectations, of course, have to be high for him. A great regular season for him. We just went off on the goals here, but he has to step up in this series. I know I'm speaking the obvious here, but I'm very curious about how he gets looked at in this series. Yeah, you know, and I think he's actually you know perform pretty well in the playoffs past, you know, to me, he doesn't wear, I mean, look at they, everyone collectively wears it. You, you win as a team and lose as a team ultimately in the playoffs. I mean, stats and the like, um, you know, don't really matter to the same degree and don't get focused on to the same degree in, in the regular season. I think, you know, for the Leafs, you know, one thing that has eluded them in, in some of their playoff losses, Florida being a great example, they scored two goals in the last seven games they played in the playoffs last year. And, you know, for a team that has the offensive weapons the Leafs do, um, that's sort of built, I think, in, in, you know, the original concept was that they could out-offense you, uh, that they were going to give you too many options, that it was going to be difficult to to shut them down uh, consistently. You know, that isn't good enough. And and so, you know, what's Austin's bread and butter, you know, scoring goals. But, I, you know, that's this is where those, you know, what I might call secondary players come into the, the fold here. I mean, Max Domi and Tyler Bertuzzi, you know, maybe give up a little bit on the defensive end of things from some of the Leafs support players in past years, but, you know, they certainly bring more on the offensive side. And, you know, I, I think it'll be, you know, kind of a, two things will be telling it's, is do they keep Matthews with Domi and Bertuzzi, which is kind of what they ran with, you know, throughout March and into April. And it had a lot of success. And I do think it, it opens up possibilities for other lines, you know, with Marner, Nylander, Tavares, even sometimes seeing those three guys play together. Um, but also how the power play goes, you know, because the Leafs power play for whatever reason has been very, very good and, and dominant outright the last three, four regular seasons. But when it's been counted on most in the playoffs, it just feels like they've never been able to get a goal here or there. And, and you know, let's face it, this team, you know, I guess it was a five game series loss to Florida last year. So that's the outlier, but it's not like they've been swept in all these playoff runs, right? I mean, they've, they're, they're getting to game seven or the game five against Columbus in the best of five. I mean, they're losing in the smallest of margins, you know, in the last number of years. And so, you know, this is no longer a young team. Um, you know, we might overrate at times, you know, playoff experience. But, I mean, the truth is, is very few teams do just make the playoffs and then go on a run to the cup final. Usually there is a, a multi-year building process and the Leafs are getting to late stages in some ways. Although, you know, they've now got Matthews and Neil Anderson. And I don't think the stakes suggest that it's now or never for them as an organization. But man, it's now or never for the next 10 to 14 days. I mean, that's that, that's that's what makes the playoffs so special. And and so I'm with you. I think a lot obviously hinges on Matthew's shoulders, but, you know, they, they need some of the, they need some big goals from other places too. You know, it can't all just be going through his stick um, because I think that, you know, the teams that tend to have playoff success, you know, get goals down their lineup. You know, the Penguins of 2016 – were fueled by a third line in a lot of cases. I mean, Crosby and Malkin had their moments in that run, and Crosby ultimately won the con smite. But it was Phil Kessel's third line that that did a lot of the damage at times. And so I think you have to be mindful of the fact that it isn't always just the stars that, you know, sometimes the stars cancel each other out on both sides. Um, and so I can't wait to get going, man. It's uh, kind of a weird few days, you know, flying back from Arizona to Toronto, doing a load of laundry, and then flying to Boston on Friday, and then right back into it. But uh 
our uh, friend of the show, Joshua Clipperton, put out a tweet the other day. Uh, he's a hockey writer for uh, the Canadian Press. Uh, he basically called out some of the media members uh, from Toronto, saying that uh, some of you guys uh, prepared for the Leafs to play the Panthers and perhaps did not uh, plan your laundry accordingly. I presume you're not one of those people. I'm not one because I was always likely heading home unless something unusual happened. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it was 90 degrees Fahrenheit on on the Coyotes last game day on Wednesday. And so obviously I uh, have no shortage of shorts or, um, you know, summer attire, we'll call it. So had I had to go to Florida, I would have been in good spot. No, I don't think I haven't looked at the Boston weather yet, but it can't be that bad. I mean, it's, we're getting, we're getting into spring in the Northeast here. So, um, you know, because I was going home, I wasn't one. I think Mark Masters, if we're going to name some names, oh. was uh, was packing for that Florida regular season trip to end and expecting Damn. to stay in Florida for a few days after. <laughs> I love it. We're airing people out. We do have to spend a bit of time on the Bruins here, too. They look like they're going to be the better defensive team going into this, but I'm also intrigued about how they're going to deploy their goalies. We've seen them rotate between Linus Allmark and Jeremy Swayman before. Uh, I haven't seen any indication that they're – going to go away from that but again another year where their stats look very very similar i'm very curious about how the bruins are going to shape up in this series as well well i think the strength there is that if it you know wherever you start doesn't mean that's where you finish i think the leafs are you know looking at it the same way the difference is the leafs don't have a proven second commodity i mean joseph wall has had some nice moments early in his NHL career but it's early in his career and he you know had a significant injury layoff during the season and, and hasn't looked the same since coming back late in the year. You know, Martin Jones, full credit to him, helped him in a difficult spot early in the season, won a bunch of games. But, you know, I don't think you want to be in a spot where you're starting him. And so, you know, it's an area where it, it would look to me the Bruins have a, an edge in the series. Um, certainly more experienced players, more accomplished players than Allmark and, and Swayman. And, you know, it, it's, it's funny. It used to be such a big storyline, who's going to start. But I, I feel like the league has just gone so often now where, I mean, of the 16 teams in the first round, we could see 10 play two goalies. Maybe it'll even be more than that. And I don't mean just one goalie coming in because a game gets out of hand and mop-up duty. I mean, like, you know, starting one and then starting the other guy at some point in the series. And, you know, that used to be a sign that things were maybe off the rails or that your, your season was – you were desperate. But I, I think in today's NHL, the, the thinking has shifted, and the Bruins are a good example of that. I mean, they, they did at least consider, I think – um, moving all market the deadline, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't know how close it ultimately got. He does have, you know, limited no trade protection in his contract. And I don't think he wanted to move on, but you know, they, 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 they thought of ways that they might be able to improve other parts of the roster by taking away from that spot ultimately didn't end up doing so. And, and, you know, that, that would be an area where I'd say the Bruins, you know, heading in look like they have a clear edge um, in that department. And, and, you know, those guys are going to be asked a lot. I mean, Boston's had a fantastic year. I mean, they, they, I mean, they were leading the Atlantic Division most of the season. Got got clipped at the wire by Florida there, but um, you know, I, I they don't, I don't see them as being I, offensively, you know, as as gifted as where the Leafs are at this stage in time. And so that's where goaltending and defensive play are really going to matter. And um, you know, it's going to be uh, it's going to be an interesting series, brother. Oh, it absolutely is. I, I don't know. Do you do you care to give a prediction? I'm willing to give you the out if you don't want to give it. I'm taking the out. I, That's I fine. really. That's it's, fine. I'm not. I, it's not even about not wanting to rile people up. I, I just have no, no clue what's going to happen. No idea. I mean, I'll tell you this. You know, I'm working with uh, Harmon, or my the writer in the Athletic and out of Vancouver on doing I mean, a Stanley yes. Cup contenders, a Stanley Cup contenders tier story where we each are talking to scouts and GMs and executives from around the league and having them rank the 16 teams in tiers um, based on the what calls I've made. And, and I haven't seen Harmon's results just yet. This will be coming out before the start of the playoffs. Obviously the least have actually were rated higher on, on the executive list than the Bruins. So, I mean, you know, at least some of the, the people around the league, I would read into that. See, the Leafs is more of a threat to win the cup than Boston. That maybe isn't the exact same as picking them and head to head in a series as strange as that might sound, but um, you know, this year, the, the playoffs feel like a coin flip. I think that story, again, I haven't, we haven't averaged all the numbers yet, but I think that story is going to underline the fact that there's, there's like four or five teams that a lot of people think could win. And, and the Leafs are probably in the next group beneath that. And um, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what any of us think they have to, 
go out and do it. And you know, the way you flip a narrative is you, you, you produce a different result. And then all of a sudden people will be talking about you differently. You'll be remembered differently. And the path you took to get there will be part of the charm. It won't be part of the, it won't be viewed as a bug of your team or your, your makeup or those types of things. For sure. Uh, we look forward to your coverage at the athletic of that first round series. Someone between those two teams is going to exercise some demons. The Bruins, again, they had the best record in the regular season ever last year, only to lose to the eventual Eastern Conference champion. They go up against the Toronto Maple Leafs. You already know their story. You already know the background. You've seen it for the last how many years when it comes to this franchise. There's a chance for demons to be exercised, and we will see it play out in the Stanley Cup playoffs. I'm looking forward to that. Well, do you know what we didn't? What we didn't talk about is, you know, at some point in time, it will be the end of the line for the Bruins. And, you know, again, I, I tip my chapeau to them mm. for the way that they've managed to carry on through, you know, Chara moving moving to other teams and retiring, losing their top two centers in Krejci and Bergeron mm. after last season. But, you know, Brad Marchand is not getting any younger. I mean, they, they don't have as many guaranteed years where I think that they, they can count on being a top contender. I mean, I suppose the nature of sports – Next year, uh, sometimes it doesn't come. You know, you, you can't always say you're going to get better. You're going to take a step forward. You can't assume too much. Um, but the stakes are pretty high for them after that regular season last year and the way things went down against the Panthers. I mean, they, this for some of their their core players, um, it's not like David Pasternak's going anywhere. I know Charlie McAvoy. I mean, they're signed long term. They're still in in years where I think they're going to be top performers. But you just don't know what's going to come in the next wave behind them. And so. You know, I, I think in a, in a strange way, it, it, it might matter a little bit more in Boston. I mean, everything in Toronto takes on life of its own, so it'll be blown up in a way that maybe it won't be in Boston. But this, you know, the stakes for the Bruins this, this spring are pretty strong because, you know, just, you just feel like every year they come back, you don't know, maybe are they just getting a little marginally worse, a little marginally older, and, you know, are they a team that, that you know, is maybe going to slide a little bit out of the picture in the next couple of years? Well, one other name we didn't really get to in the Leafs conversation is Mitch Marner because – Austin Matthews finds ways to perform in the playoffs, but I feel like, at least from an outsider's perspective, Mitch Marner gets a lot of flack for some of the for some of the games that he's played, and I think some of it's deserved uh, throughout his time his, his time with the Leafs in the playoffs as well. Like this has to be a legacy series for him too. It's deserved, but it's overblown, right? I mean, he he plays under a, an especially fine microscope where I think people are literally watching every shift and reading into every play and. Seeing each giveaway as like a, you know, an example of what they want to believe, or you know, I mean, we're, we're talking about still a top player in the league. You know, I think where, you know, what's happened to Mitch is that, you know, there are times in the playoffs where certainly the production's gone away on him. You know, you can see it affecting him. I mean, no one is at all, at least that I that I think is either paying attention or spent time around him. Doesn't think he doesn't want to win. Isn't giving his all to win. You know, but you know, it's it's hard in the playoffs. Like that's that's just the reality. I mean, you can. You can go through the stats of any great player, even the ones that have won, and go year by year. There are, there are just years where the goals or assists don't fall. I mean, you, you don't have time. You don't always have time to balance out the good luck with the bad luck, which you do over a season. You know, players go through stretches where the, the production is not there, but if you play long enough, the numbers, if you're good enough, usually end up where they're, they're supposed to be. Um, you know, and in Mitch's case, I think he's been on the wrong end of some of those things. And, you know, when I talk about things like the power play not clicking in the playoffs, I mean, that's an area where he can get, you know, usually if when the Leafs play out, power plays having success, he's in the middle of it, you know, making a, a feed. You know, we've seen him score a little bit more in the last couple of seasons where he's been more of a shooter. Um, you know, certainly if he could get some goals early in the series or some points on the board, it might, might ease some of the pressure. But, you know, the reality is, is he's a hometown guy. I think he... I think he wears it heavy a little bit. Um, you know, I think sometimes the, the attention and the focus and the social media and kind of the mania that, that surrounds the team, you know, he feels that. But um, certainly by no means do I think uh, it's, it's not all on him, but, but he's certainly going to be in the middle of everything as we, we go through this. Okay, again, be sure to check out CJ's work at The Athletic for this Leafs Brood series. Uh, it's funny, we started by talking about the – uh, the Leafs lightning game, obviously Austin doesn't get 70, but Nikita Kucherov gets assist number 100. Uh, now's a good time to, you know, make sure that you, you submitted your ballot for the NHL awards this year, Siege, because we still have to, I mean, I still have to figure out who I'm picking for the MVP. I wonder for Nikita Kucherov where 
he fits in the discussion for MVP. Is he second? Is he third? Does him getting the 100th assist matter in all of this to you? I would love to know your thoughts. I think he's the favorite, to be honest. I mean, the guy leads the league in points. He's got 50-odd more points than the next guy on his team. He's in on 50% of their goals over a season. He hits that 100-point or 100-assist uh, you know, plateau. I mean, to me, all those things, you know, we can twist ourselves in knots, but but all those things to me suggest he's, he's the likely top candidate. Now, I, I have got no idea how voters around the, the continent feel or, and beyond. Um, and, and obviously, as we've discussed in recent weeks, it's not an easy call. It's not an easy choice for people to make. I'm not going to come on here if someone has Nathan McKinnon first and say, how could you do that? Or, you know. Austin Matthews, maybe even Connor McDavid, Connor Hellebuck, all the all the guys we've talked about. I mean, I don't I don't think there's necessarily a one right answer, but for me, you know, I haven't submitted my ballot, but you know, I'm leaning very, very heavily towards Kucherov, number one for for the Hart Trophy, and you know, it's it's just it's difficult for me not to look at the wording of the award award where you're trying to identify the player most valuable to his team, and see the impact that that Kucherov had in Tampa this year. And, you know, he also led the league in points. I mean, and, and wasn't doing it just with one line mate. I mean, he certainly got some talented teammates and guys who still finished top 30, top 40 in league scoring, but, you know, he was, you know, over and above everyone. And, you know, I, I do think that, that ultimately he, he, he deserves to win it, but, you know, we're not going to find out until June 27th when the awards are given out, how, how our peers feel. And, and, you know, for anyone who doesn't know how the, the process works, I mean, we are down to the, the final, days here to, to vote you know the, the the ballots have to be submitted before the start of the playoffs you know so as anything that happens on day one of the playoffs or, or beyond is not factored into how the, the the voting goes but um you know just a superlative season from kucherov and and you know i think he really accomplished something special i thought it was pretty cool to see the way his teammates celebrated with him when he when he got that 100th assist you know it was clear that it's something they took a lot of pride in and you know it is kind of a weird one right i mean with with Austin Matthews, who's, when he's chasing seventy, like he's got to shoot the puck into the net to make it happen it, with an assist. And I know Kucherov can throw, you know, passes into the the high slot there, and Braden Point's pretty good at burying those. But you know, he still needs someone else to to ultimately be the one who beats the goaltender. And so, you know, it is it is a team accomplishment, um, in in some respects. And I and I sort of felt like I saw that in watching the way the Bolts uh, reacted when when he hit that that big milestone. Man, I, I'm I haven't submitted my my ballot either, and I'm racking my brain over this. Do I vote for the guy who was an automatic point getter at home every year, who was obviously very near the top of the points leaderboard? Do I vote for the leader in points? Do I vote for the other guy who got a hundred assists in a season and helped his team from the bring them up from the depths of hell at the beginning of the year to now where they're a clear playoff team? Do I vote for the guy who almost hit 70 this year? Who's going to be fifth on my ballot? Like, there's, I mean, I've only been voting for what, maybe two years at this? This is such a difficult MVP race to call. I mean, I think it's more between the first three guys I'm alluding to, but I don't know how people are going to decide. And I get that everyone's going to have their reasons and picks, but like, for me, I, I, I'm going to be thinking about this up until the wire. Like, I, I can't, I can't make a decision right now. It's too difficult. It's too hard. Yeah. I mean, the hard thing for me is you want to do it justice. You want history to be reflected in a certain way. That's, you know, when someone looks back on the 2023, 24 season that that we've identified the right winner. I mean, quite honestly, there's always outlier boats. There's always boats that, that get dragged on the internet, but I think as a whole, the voting body does a really good job of getting it as close to right as you can. I mean, sometimes there isn't one right answer. I think that that's ultimately where I'm going to land here. Like one player is going to win the heart. I mean, maybe an entirely different person will win the Ted Lindsay, right? Which is voted on yep. by the players for their most outstanding player. I mean, I think that'll be an interesting vote. I, I could quite honestly, I don't think I don't have any expectation that Austin Matthews will win the heart. I could see Austin Matthews winning the Ted Lindsay that, that, you know, his peers have that level of respect. I mean, you look at adjusted for era goal seasons, that's the second all time season uh, in terms of production by a player. And, and, you know, Austin had a few goals called back by offside reviews this year. He had, I think he hit 20 posts and crossbars or something. I mean, he, he wasn't that far away from doing something just insane. Um, and 69 goals, frankly, is insane. So, I mean, I guess my point is, is this. 
I'm not lobbying a case for Austin Matthews for the heart, but I'm just saying that I, I think that lots of people can look at this and come up with different results and still not necessarily be wrong. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going with my, no pun intended, I'm going with my heart, with my head. I'm going with like where my intuition takes me and my, you know, my, my thoughts are that Kucherov was the guy really helped Tampa through a tough start to the year. And, you know, clearly pulled their team through from an offensive standpoint. I just, I, there's no way to question that. I know that you might break down, oh, he had 14 empty net points or this or that. I mean, the, the guy still ended up at 140 plus points, 100 assists, and, you know, the lightning trudge on, I think, in large part because of what he was able to do. All right. Well, uh, to everyone listening and watching, don't be mad at us when the ballots come out. It was a very difficult process to determine who the heart trophy winner will be and of course for some of the i want you to be mad as hell well. i want you to be mad as hell you go want to jk mckenzie on on twitter and just tell him all the things that he you didn't like about his ballot because i mean look at the norris there's there's a debate in the norris voting i would say you know even the calder voting you could have you, you know there's some brock faber stands out there obviously you know connor bedard missed sometimes i mean none of these are easy the selkie like uh, it, it's not the job is not meant to be easy. The, the, the best thing is we cover a league with like insanely talented players. And a lot of them brought their best this year. And we got to sort through the wreckage of that and try to make some sense of it. Go to reporter Chris and be mad at him too. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Let's talk. I can take it. Me too. Anyway, let's go to Arizona. Uh, you were at the final game for the Arizona Coyotes uh, against the Edmonton Oilers on Wednesday night. I tried to watch as much as I could on the uh, broadcast on, on Sportsnet. And I have to admit, I, I know some people have made the allusion to this too. I, I definitely got Montreal Expos vibes watching that. Just the end of an era for a team and seeing the players at the end get on the ice and, and hugging the longtime trainer Stan Wilson, uh, seeing the final uh, salute from, from broadcaster Todd Walsh. I feel bad. I, I feel really awful for those Coyotes fans. What was it like for you at Mullet Arena, experiencing everything, watching the game? Take us through it. It's one of those nights where you understand why the team was here in the first place, because there really is a community around this Coyotes team. You know, as I mentioned at the top, it, it, it's happening on a night where a guy from Scottsdale is chasing 70 goals down. Uh, you know, you got Josh Doan in the game, whose dad Shane played in the first ever Coyotes game, and he's, he's had such a promising start to his career. Um, you know, you can understand why the Coyotes were here, but then I can understand why they're leaving. Because, quite honestly, to step inside the Mullet Arena for the first time, as I did on Wednesday, and, and see the game played, I mean, it it would lose its charm pretty quickly. Like I could see, like it it's flat out cool to watch. Connor McDavid from the 13th row, which is the last row in that building. So like, there's not a bad seat to watch, to see how fast these guys are, how, how big they are. I mean, most of us don't get to sit in the lower bowl at an NHL game ever. Uh, you know, even if you get, it's, you're lucky to get in the building. And even if you do, you might be way up in the ceiling and it looks like a chessboard rather than the, the sea of bodies it is at ice level. But I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's just not a facility that, that was going to be able to, to house hockey for too long. Um, so I can understand why they're leaving when, when I see it and, and understand just how far they are from getting an arena built in this area. I have to say Tempe itself is awesome. Yes. I mean, the, the, the proposed site where, you know, they were voted down in the, the referendum last May, you know, it was only about a mile from where I'm sitting right now. And like, if, if they were able to build an awesome arena district there, I mean, again, there would be no one in the league who wouldn't want to do road trips out here. To experience the weather, the the vibes on on the campus at Arizona State University, like it's it's um, you know it's a cool spot. But you know, I, I felt bad for everyone too. Um, there's a human side to this, and that's that's what I was seeing kind of behind the scenes. You know, the first intermission, I went up to the suite level, and there's just a line of people waiting for selfies, for a handshake, for a hug with Shane Doan. Even a few old school people asking for autographs up there. I saw Russell Martin. Former Blue Jay, really? uh, among other, yeah, Russell Martin, he lives out here now. He was, he was chatting with Shane Doan, talking about their families. Um, you know, a lot of people with a Kleenex in their hand up there, like the people that have been working behind the scenes that have, you know, done a lot of various jobs for the Coyotes maybe over, over the years. And, and you, you just, it felt like a little bit like family. Honestly, it felt almost like a receiving line at, at a wake or something 
Um, it wasn't all sad, honestly, even, you know, I had a chance to chat with Shane, like he was saying for him, he was trying to focus on all the great memories that he had. He, you know, he said he viewed this as sort of the end of this chapter of the Coyotes, but he's hoping, you know, hockey in Arizona, you know, that there will be a much longer book in time. You know, he even talked about what he told his son, Josh, you know, remember Shane played one year with the original Winnipeg Jets after being drafted. He was a young kid when the team moved here and, and obviously became a franchise legend. He has the most games, the most goals, the most assists, the most points, the most everything. Uh, the, probably the most selfies and, and autographs signed over the years too, because he's such a fan favorite here. But, but he told his son, Josh, who, who grew up obviously in Scottsdale as a Coyotes fan. He's I'm sure some level for him is heartbroken as he moves to Salt Lake city. But he said, Josh, I came here. I, I didn't know anything about Arizona. Like, and look what this became. Like, look how special this was. This is where we raised our family and, and we made all these roots and, and um, you know, who knows what Salt Lake, you, you, no one knows what the future holds. I mean, maybe one day we're talking about, Josh Doan in that way in Salt Lake City. Like, it's anything's possible. And so, you know, it was a weird night. It, it did not feel, I'll say, it did not feel like a funeral in the building. Like, it, it felt like a hockey game. Like, just in the stands, watching the game itself. You know, the Coyotes really wanted to go out on a high note. And I thought they they played their asses off. And, and you know, they got a win that, that you know, doesn't matter in the standings. But I think it, it says something about them as a group. You know, they won three of their last four games after all this, you know, broke and, and the other game they lost was the one you saw in Calgary where they were ahead in the third period and, and you know couldn't quite hold on to a lead but I mean they, they play hard to the end um, they gave the fans something to cheer about on the last night they you know they they did have that nice moment where they're saluting them and ultimately did that sort of jerseys off your back thing they had all the fans stream onto the ice and um, you know it's a night of mixed emotions and and you know the it's it, this franchise just never quite got it right from a big picture standpoint, but it, a lot of things, a lot of people had to, like, I think there's a lesson, a larger lesson the Coyotes taught us in a sense is that they had to make do with, with less than other people had. And, and they did make some good out of it. I mean, they, they clearly have a close bond here and, and the, you know, I've gotten to know the hockey community down in Arizona a little bit because I've covered Austin Matthews first eight years in the NHL pretty closely. And, and, you know, there, there really is, there's a, there's a thriving hockey community here. Um, it's, it's been, it hasn't been serviced properly by the people that have owned and run the organization over multiple ownership groups over a long period of time. And, and that's how you get to a night like last night and a day like today, where, you know, by the time this episode's out, you probably will have heard the news that the NHL's board of governors has ratified the move to Salt Lake city. Mm -hmm. you know, there's going to be a press conference there in the next couple of days with Gary Bettman. Won't be long before the Coyotes players and staff are traveling there and sizing up their new accommodations. You know, we'll, we'll kind of move on with life. They'll, they'll unveil a sweater and a name and all the like. You know, we'll move on. But um, the, the Coyotes really left something behind here, and there's there's a hockey community, and and there's gonna we haven't seen the last Arizona-born player to play in the league. I know that much. I mean, this, this is a thriving minor hockey area, and. A lot of players retire here and therefore, you know, pass along what they've learned to the next generation. And, you know, I look forward to the day I can come back to to see a new team you know, being born because it was, you know, it was a sad night. And I just know a lot of people put a lot into it. I mean, there's so many staff of the team. Like, we don't have to spend too much time on this. Like, it's just, it's not, it's not nice. If you've ever been part of a company that's been maybe merged with another one or, or maybe even relocated like this, in this case, like there's a lot of people that, are not earning the uh, NHL player salaries that don't know their future and that, you know, are kind of making some, some jokes, you know, the kind of gallows humor that you'd expect, but like, hope my key card works tomorrow and all this stuff, because, you know, I don't know if you saw this, Julian, Shane Doan got his banner given back to him. I saw that. That is insane. Like, so, so, so you mean, what so, happened you know, there? I, tell I've the story, touch, please. I've been, yeah, I've been in touch with the the gentleman who, who returned it to him, and basically it was part. It was in a storage area somewhere in the rink, and and I guess they were just getting rid of anything Coyotes. Um, like I'm not saying the building wanted to. I don't know if it's ownership or who instructed that. And and he noticed the Doan banner, and he he saved it, and uh, ultimately repatriated it to Shane. Shane said it's massive. I asked, like, I asked him like, are you gonna put that up in your house? He's like, I have no idea. He's like it's too big. Like, but you know. <laughs> It's just, it's so bizarre to me at a time. I mean, look, that might just be an oversight. Like, I don't want to make too much of it because, like, I don't know how exactly it ended up there. But it did, it does appear it was destined for the, the garbage if, if it wasn't saved. And, you know, it's it's just such a shame that the team wasn't managed better, that, that even details like that wouldn't be preserved. Because, you know, ultimately, 
Alex Morello or someone else is probably going to try to bring back a team. They might end up being called the Coyotes. You th- you think you'd want the, some of those pieces of history, but um, you know it, it was a, a franchise that just never got it right. But uh, as I say, that doesn't mean everything was wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I think on a night like that, you feel that weird feeling because. Lots of people who might not otherwise have liked hockey were in that building, liking hockey, crying, commiserating together, going to bars after the game to, to sort of, you know, share their experiences as you do often after a wake. As I say, it, it did feel, felt a little bit like, it, again, it wasn't all sad, but it was, you know, it was heavy. It was heavy. And, um, you know, this is a great place to live and they just got to get it right next time. I don't think there's much more for me to say than that. They just got to get it right the next time and, now, Salt Lake City is going to be an interesting experiment. I, I don't think it's a slam dunk by any means that this is, you know, they're moving into, I think it'll be the third oldest building in the league right away. It's a smaller city. You know, seems like an owner everyone speaks highly of in Ryan Smith, but, you know, it's it's going to be a challenge to get it right there. And, and you know, they, they kind of solve one, like there's a clean break here because it, it just felt like it was dragging on forever and it was never going to be fixed. But, you know, there's there's still work to be done as they arrive in Salt Lake City as well. By the way, uh, shout out to Alex Morello, who, according to on the floor reports, he was not even able to show up for his team's final game. No, there was there, there were Great many job. signs, but I saw three or four signs directly, you know, about Morello, like you know, some kind of not not flattering Morello thing. I mean, I get it. He didn't make a lot of he didn't make a lot of friends in the community. He you know, angered trade unions. He angered, didn't pay all his bills in the previous stop. And it looks like he's making out like a bandit, right? So I can see why as as a fan or even, you know, quite frankly, people within the organization, I can see why they feel that that he didn't service them at all and wasn't looking out for the betterment of the product. This is what's weird about sports, right? At At the end of the day, it is just a business. It's you know, the owner has to be making money or has to believe that they're going to make money over time in order to stay in that business. But there's also, you're asking for people's sort of a piece of the people that pay for your business, right? The, the, the community and things like that. And, and, you know, so I think that those are the people that feel really let down. And as a result, he wasn't in the building. Absolutely. Uh, be sure to check out CJ's piece on that last game. It's called Coyotes Say Goodbye, Close Chapter in Arizona Before Salt Lake City Relocation. I, I just want to say the opening line uh, really got me uh, of that story. They gathered one last time here together because that's what you do when your heart is breaking and your mind is racing. That that line just, I don't know why it did, but it got to me. So I just want to give you your flowers for that because that's a really good piece. <laughs> and you can read that. It was Rick. Re- Sadly, it was written at a far too late hour with like one ten percent of brain power. I mean, we've all been there. This is part of the job. But like sometimes, it's been a, it's been a busy few days down here. Honestly, I told you. I think I, I think I've shared with the pod. I was coming here to do a totally different story. I didn't anticipate this was all going to blow up on the timeline that it did. I did anticipate this was the last Coyote season, but I was going to come down to kind of maybe before the storm to to tell some stories that were a little more calm. But it was it was difficult and and. Yeah, I think everyone did the best they could under the circumstances. I got to say the the players were all really generous with their time last night. Andre Trigny, to me, is something I haven't spent a lot of time around the head coach of the team, but man, what a that guy could coach my team any day. What a passionate guy, and and um, you know, I know he's well thought of from the hockey standpoint, but really, like I thought he was the right person. You know, he had to be at the front lines every day, right? It, you know, because some parts of this they 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 kept the players away from the media because they. I think they just didn't know what can the players say. Nothing's official yet. They know what the questions are going to be. It was just an awkward spot for a few days. Um, but Terigny, I thought, in the face of everything that went on here, was just, I mean, what a leader. Um, no wonder he's, you know, they, they want to keep him in Salt Lake City. He's going to, he, 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 would, he would have a, a number of teams knocking at his door if, if they didn't. But, you know, I think he's going to go to Salt Lake with the team. Absolutely. Um, do you have a stick tap as we wrap up our uh, episode? But well, we'd be missing the boat if we saw Jeff Carter play his last NHL game. Given what he's meant to the pod, given that he inadvertently became part of, um, you know, part of what we do here and the fun we have with our 100 percenters. I mean, Jeff Carter had a hell of a career and uh, he's, he's hanging it up. So 
maybe I stole the obvious one. I guess we maybe double stick tap it from both of us to the, the people that poured their heart into the oats over the years. We'll pour one out for them and then we'll raise a glass to Jeff Carter because, I mean, it's just sitting there on the tee for us, pal. I mean, it's right there. Seriously. I, I didn't even... Uh... I'm just, we didn't even think about it. I just, I just knew he was going to get shouted out between you and I. So I'm glad we had that shout out and I'm glad we were able to also do a double stick tap for everyone in Arizona, uh, whether it's, it's anyone who worked with the team, whether it's anyone like Craig Morgan, who's covered the team for quite some time, uh, the fans there, uh, look, it, it's yeah, never Steve easy Peter, to... So I met down here, worked for years as a video coach and was working in, in media with, with Craig, you know, down here, Patrick Brown um, was the team reporter just such a nice guy doesn't know what his future holds i mean it sucks man like the, like you can only put yourself in the, the position of these people who poured a lot of their own time and energy into it it just it just flat out sucks you know biz, the, the business of pro sports can be pretty cruel and this this feels cruel even though i get i totally understand why the coyotes are leaving don't get me wrong as i said if i had to go to a second game at Mullet arena that might be one too many um just because it's it really it's just not a facility that Connor McDavid should be playing actual games in um, or, or his peers, not just Connor. But um, I do feel for the, I do, do feel for the, all these folks that I met that were just so kind these last few days. For sure. Um, I'll also, maybe it might be too soon to do, but Salt Lake City fans, you're getting an NHL team that looks like it's going to be promising. Uh, word coming down, uh, I'm just reading off a Darren Dreger tweet that uh, Ryan Smith is supposed to meet with Coyotes players and staff in Arizona today assuming everything goes well uh, with the board of governors and the approval of that move, uh, there could be some exciting times ahead for that city. And there are fans in that market who want to get behind that team too. And they have a history with hockey as well through teams like the Utah Grizzlies of the ECHL. Uh, it's an exciting time for them too. And, you know, hopefully they're able to treasure that team and, and do the best with it. I'm, I'm excited to see what turns out with the team, but also just keep a thought for the Arizona fans today. Uh, I think that's going to do it for our Thursday edition of the CJ show. Get your questions in for Monday, whether on discord or on Twitter and subscribe to the podcast. If you haven't done so already, CJ, great work as always. Be sure to follow his work at the athletic. I'm Julian. We'll talk to you guys on Monday. Playoffs. The Chris Johnston show inside the game twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at reporter Chris and follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie. 